We were <clears throat> talking a little while ago about, uh, uh, Jeremy asked everybody who has seen a total eclipse to raise their hand, and I can't do that. Uh, I have been in the shadow of the moon, but it was clouded out. This was in Hawaii in 1991. Uh, it, the clouds moved aside so I could see partial phase. But what really sticks in my mind, he's talking about the shadow, uh, the trailing shadow of the moon and how fast it moves. Uh, no one had mentioned this to any of us. And I happened to look out to the west, out over the Pacific Ocean, uh, as the eclipse was ending, and I saw that it was getting lighter out there, and then I could see the trailing edge of the moon's shadow and how fast that thing was going. And it passed over us, and I turned and I watched it go across the lava desert, which is that side of the big island, to the mountains in the center of the island, and it was amazing how fast that shadow moved. And uh, uh, 1,700 miles an hour is, is uh, a, it, that's, a, that's a good figure. It, it, I'm sure it varies depending on how close the moon is to the Earth in its orbit. That time, the moon was almost as close as it is possible for it to get because the, the eclipse lasted more than seven minutes. This one uh, upcoming will be two minutes, two minutes, 40 seconds maybe. Uh, so quite a difference. Um, well, you know, I went there, uh, my, my wife and son and I went, and brother Kevin Ryan, also one of our members, uh, went. And another one of our members, uh, uh, now a former member, Ralph Chumbley, who's since retired and moved to uh, Nashville, um, hopped on a plane that, that morning and he went to Cabo San Lucas in Baja, California, where they got about seven minutes of totality. And he just, I think he just flew down to the airport, watched the eclipse, got on the plane and came home. Uh, so he got to see it and I didn't. But I, it was still a great trip anyway. Um, let's see, there we go. Um, this is the island of Antikythera right here. This is Kythera. This is the, the large island. That's uh, Kythera in uh, Greek mythology was where Aphrodite emerged from the waves. You may have seen the painting of, uh, uh, I think it's Botticelli. I don't remember uh, which of the, uh, the Renaissance artists painted that one. Now, emerging from the waves, that was on Kythera. Antikythera is this little island here. And in 1900, some Greek sponge divers sought refuge in the harbor there uh, from a storm. And after the storm cleared, they went down uh, 42 meters and they found a wrecked ship from the Roman era. Uh, all kinds of very valuable things that they took off of it. And they also found this lump of bronze and wood and instead of leaving it there, they took it, you know, maybe it would be worth something. Over time, the wood began to dry out, that, that happens. And then when it's like uh, you, you, if they find an old sunken ship, they will not just expose it to air because it will dry out and it will crumble. So they have to preserve it. Um, and by 1902, uh, archaeologists had begun to, of course, look at all of the uh, artifacts that they had brought up. And this uh, Greek archaeologist noticed what looked like gear wheels inside. So over time, um, not much was done with it until Derek DeSoya Price, who had, a, he had two PhDs. He was a PhD in um, astronomy, astrophysics, and he got a second PhD in the history of science. And he went and took a closer look at it. This is, this is some of the best pictures of it that I could find. Uh, you can see this is the, uh, the, the central gear housing here, and the, the right and left sides, front and back dials. Um, close up of the central gear, you can see how corroded it was. Uh, well, 2,000 years submerged in salt water will do that. 
Uh, the back side of the central gear housing, the right side, left side, and so forth, the door plate. And we'll get into the details uh, toward the end of this. Front dial, and you can see uh, it was graduated here, tick marks in a curve. You can also see uh, writing. Uh, they have now sort of deciphered or, or resurrected about 3,400 letters, Greek characters, and out of, uh, they guess, maybe uh, 20,000 uh, total uh, on, the, on the device originally, wow. but have been lost. So, uh, the Sawyer Price analyzed it, and this was his first publication in Scientific American, 1959. Um, some years later, he and um, Dr. Karakakalos took X-ray and gamma ray images of the mechanism to get a better look at it. And then he published Gears from the Greeks. And this is um, a much longer description of it and its purpose. He concluded that it was um, it, it's like, it's, we have software planetarium today. This was mechanical. And if you think of the, the uh, state of technology uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, this is just all the more remarkable. So how do you date it? Uh, from coins, uh, the styles of the amphora, the jugs, the pottery, and so on, roughly 85 BC. Julius Caesar was 15 years old at the time. The writing style of the, of the inscriptions on there uh, suggests that it was made about 100 BC, give or take. It went down in a uh, very busy shipping lane. Uh, ships at that time did not stray far from land. They generally stayed within sight of land. Uh, navigation was uh, uh, finding your, your latitude was not a problem, finding your longitude was, and remained so until uh, the middle of the 18th century. This was, it was a big ship for its time, uh, and it carried a lot of cargo, a lot of valuable cargo, uh, almost certainly uh, bound for Rome. The vases on it were in the style of Rhodes, and there's other evidence pointing to an origin on the island of Rhodes which was the center of Greek astronomy in the first and second centuries BC. Uh, there were several famous uh, Greek astronomers, and we will get to a few of those, including Hipparchus, who is uh, arguably the greatest of the ancient Greek astronomers. Uh, he worked there um, for about 20 years until his death. And then another Greek astronomer, Posidonius, set up a, an astronomy school there and kept on with, uh, kept up the tradition. Hipparchus uh, was a remarkable thinker. This is some, just some of the things he did. Um, quantitative, accurate models of lo uh, lunar and solar motion. Um, he, the, you know, the Babylonians had been at this for a number of centuries. Um, it was important to their religion. This was their, uh, a lot of a lot of astronomy comes from astrology. It was uh, in the service of astrology, but a lot of uh, important discoveries were made um, for the wrong purpose. I still get people who confuse astronomy and astrology, and I say, "Oh, you're a member of the Astrological Society?" No, I'm not. Um, <laughs> A number of years ago, gosh, about uh, must have been oh, 35 years or so ago, uh, uh, we had an awful lot of people show up. This is when we were meeting at the Pink Palace. And we had that room was just packed, and uh, we were kind of looking around, well, what's going on? Turns out um, the uh, Commercial Appeal had said that the astrological, the Riverside Astrological Society would be meeting, and that's why most of these people were there. And so, uh, uh, the, the president informed them that no, actually this is astronomy and 
uh, you're welcome to stay, and, um, and they politely did until the break at the half, and then most of them went away. <laughs> but um, Hipparchus um, used Babylonian observations as well as his own. He compiled trigonometric tables. He worked uh, problems in spherical trigonometry. Uh, probably, we think, was the first to be uh, able to predict eclipses reliably. That was a goal of the Babylonian astronomers as well. Um, he discovered precession of the equinoxes, that is, the, that the Earth's axis wobbles over approximately 26,000 year period so that the constellations, uh, the, the equinoxes appear to move with the constellations. This is one reason that astrology is uh, really off base today because your sun sign, the one that you are allegedly born under, uh, is off by about 2,000 years. Uh, if you think you are, for example, a Capricorn, you're not. You're Sagittarius. Uh, because the Earth's uh, axis does not point where it did 2,500 years ago when that system was set up. The first star catalog, um, Posidonius is not a name that you hear a lot, but he was, uh, he was working there on the island of Rhodes, uh, probably with Aristarchus. Um, he made a number of calculations, uh, the distance of the sun, well, not, not too accurate there. Uh, the size of the sun, uh, pretty accurate. The circumference of the earth. He used the elevation of Canopus. That was a bad choice um, because he, did, he, he knew about atmospheric refraction. That is, uh, because the atmosphere bends light, things close to the horizon appear to be higher than they really are. Canopus, even in his time, about 100 BC, never got more than a couple of degrees above the horizon, which is about what, where you can see it here today uh, in February, if you're lucky. And uh, he based uh, his circumference of the Earth on measurements of Canopus. Instead of using a star much higher in the sky, uh, like Sirius, uh, which would have been a lot better, so he was off on that. There we go. He believed that the moon causes tides, uh, and this he, he he got the answer right for the wrong reason. This is why your math teachers always said show your work, uh, because he believed that the moon causes tides because the moon is made of fire and air. Okay, you remember the, the four Greek elements, earth, air, fire, and water. Uh, he thought the moon was made of fire and air, and so it would heat the water until it swelled, and that was the cause of tides. Uh, well, that's not. The moon does cause the tides, but for a totally different reason. Regarding the circumference of the earth, um, he calculated it to be uh, 18,000 miles in our measurements uh, neglecting atmospheric refraction, Ptolemy accepted that, and Columbus relied on Ptolemy when he made his presentation, when he made his plans to sail uh, to the Indies, uh, to Asia, from Europe by going west, and he probably wouldn't have done it if he'd known the true circumference, and probably um, Fernando and Isabel, the king and queen of Spain, would not have bankrolled his voyage if uh, they had had the correct circumference of the earth of 25,000 miles approximately. Uh, now, which brings, brings the question up, okay, would we be sitting here today, uh, here talking about this, if uh, they had had the correct circumference of the earth? The answer is, yeah, we would because uh, somebody else would have done it eventually. Somebody from Europe was going to come west and find uh, this continent anyway. Um, the Roman lawyer Cicero, who would have pronounced his name Cicero, was an almost exact contemporary of Julius Caesar, and he knew of an instrument that 
would reproduce the motions of the sun, moon, and the five known planets, the planets known to the ancients. Um, he knew about it because um, some friends of his family were descended from the Roman general Marcellus, who when the town, the city of Syracuse in Sicily was sacked in 212 BC and Archimedes was killed. Um, it was said that Archimedes had made a device like this. Marcellus took it, booty of war, and it was handed down in his family and uh, Cicero probably saw this uh, in, in uh, his friend's home. Now, we talked about you know, how do you, how do you know when these things are going to happen? There are several cycles, several lunar cycles that you have to understand in order to be able to predict eclipses. The metonic cycle is one. Meton was a uh, Greek mathematician in the fifth century BC and this is a crater on the moon that is named after him. Um, he found that in 19 solar years, there are 235 synodic lunar months and 254 sidereal months. Okay, what are they? Synodic month is from new moon to new moon. Sidereal month is the time it takes the moon to get to the same location in the sky with respect to the stars. So, okay, how come they're different? Well, it's because new moon to new moon, there are um, fewer of them because during the time that it takes to get to the, to the next location, the Earth is moved in its orbit about one-twelfth of the way around. Callippus was another uh, Greek mathematician uh, and astronomer who lived about a hundred years later. And this is a crater on the moon named after him. He found that four metonic cycles, less one day, is 940 luna lunations, that is, uh, appearances of the moon, in 76 years, less one day. And he was trying to improve the prediction relation for whole numbers of the year. But, uh, Greek mathematics uh, was based on geometry. They did not have a decimal system they used lowercase letters of the alphabet to represent numbers, and it was a very complex system. It was uh, the first, um, I forget, the first, like, first 20 letters, first 20, then, then you switch over to something different, and uh, it was very complicated and made doing things difficult, and so they kept looking, is, is the, can, you, can you come up with whole numbers? Uh, and that was one thing that he was trying to do, and it just didn't quite work out. Um, metonic and calyptic cycles are both compared to the tropical year, that is summer solstice, summer solstice, which was adopted as the official Athenian year. Now there's, uh, there are four logical times to start a new year. The two solstices, summer and winter solstices, or the spring and fall equinoxes. And people have uh, started their years using those for a long time. The reason we use January 1st rather than, say, the vernal equinox, which was used for a very long time, um, or the, um, the winter equinox, the December, I mean, not uh, December solstice, uh, is that on January 1st in the time of Julius Caesar, that was when the newly elected consuls took office. So he said, we'll start the year on January 1st. So that, uh, that was discontinued uh, about uh, almost 600 years later because the, uh, then the, the church, which was the official religion in Rome, thought that that smacked too much of paganism, so they went to uh, 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 the vernal equinox or the date of Easter or uh, times approximating that and it stayed that way for a very long time, including in British possessions in, um, in North America uh, until 1752 because uh, although the Gregorian calendar was introduced in 1582, 
and was adopted in all Catholic countries. This supplanted the old Julian calendar, which was out of step with the actual passage of time. Um, it was adopted by all the Catholic countries, but at that time, uh, England was resolutely anti-Catholic, and so they weren't having any, anything having to do, that no pope's gonna tell us how to count time, and so it took until 1752 to get off the Julian calendar, and uh, uh, they adopted January 1st as the uh, beginning of the new year, and so you will still see, in looking at dates in American history before that year. Uh, if it's in the, if in the, between January and uh, March, uh, you will see the date slash like 1750, 51, uh, because it, it, you have to use the different, the two different calendars. The metonic cycle compared to the tropical year was too long by six and a half minutes the Calypic cycle was too short by 12 minutes, 23 seconds per year, um, but they couldn't keep time well enough at that point to know that. So, now we come to the Saros, and this is how you predict the, the times of lunar eclipses. The synodic month, remember, okay, new moon to new moon. There's another kind of month, the draconitic month. Remember um, uh, about the, uh, the man uh, who stepped out of his lodge and fired a pistol at the, at the eclipsed uh, sun to get it, well, the draconitic, the, the, uh, the, the, the draco part of that is the dragon. The people believed uh, that a dragon was eating the sun. And so that's the draconitic month from node to node. That is, the node is where the moon's orbit crosses the Earth's orbit, okay? That's, and uh, Jeremy was talking about what it has to cross that node. When it's at a node is the only time it can cast its shadow on the Earth, and that node has to be just lined up with the Earth, and most of the time it isn't. Otherwise, we would have eclipses every month. Another kind of month, the anomalistic month, is perigee to perigee. That is the closest point the moon reaches to the Earth to the next time it is at its closest point. So, here's some relation, interesting relations. 223 synodic months is about the same as 242 draconitic months, which is about the same as 239 anomalistic months, plus or minus a couple of hours. And this works out to 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. And that is the Saros. Now, that means that after one Saros cycle, 18 years, 11, 18 years, 11, uh, what was it again? 11 days and 8 hours. Um, then the moon will be at the same phase, the same node, the same distance from the earth, which means that the geometry is going to be almost exactly the same. So if you know one date of eclipse, one Saros later, you should get a very similar appearing eclipse, but you've got that eight hour difference, or about a third of the day. Uh, and that means that because the Earth rotates, that eight hour period, it means that eclipse path is gonna shift about a third of the way around the Earth, or 360 divided by three, about 120 degrees westward. So after three Saros cycles, 50 year, 54 years, one month. It will happen at almost the same time uh, at about the same longitude. And three Saros cycles are known as, the, the Greek term is the exoligmos, which means the turning of the wheel, or the triple Saros. Now, here's, some, here's an example. This is, um, this is the 1991 eclipse. This is the one where I went here to Hawaii to see it and got clouded out. And you can see, let's start with the 1937 eclipse uh, in this cycle, this is Saros 136. 18 years later, 1937 to 1955, okay, the eclipse path is at similar latitudes, but longitude is shifted 120 degrees. Another 18 years, 1973, Again, it's shifted 
another 120 degrees, so you're two-thirds of the way around the world, another 18 years, 1991, and you're back in the same, approximately the same longitude, but the latitude is moving. Another 18 years, 2009, see 120 degrees west, Another 18 years in 2027, this is where it'll be, 2045, this is one that will cross the United States also, uh, 2063, 2081. Notice that they're moving north, okay, as time goes on. That's because it depends on where the moon started these eclipses. The eclipses start at one pole or the other. And if they start at the South Pole, then they move progressively north. If they start at the North Pole, they move progressively south as the Saros goes on. <coughs> Saros cycles last a long time each, um, between 1,226 and 1,550 years, uh, and it's this many eclipses. Now, these are not all total eclipses. There are partial eclipses and annual eclipses as well as total eclipses in that mix. About 40 of them are central eclipses, central being either total or annular, and all the rest are partial. Now, if they take place near the moon's uh, ascending node, they have odd numbers. Those taking place near the descending node have even numbers. This, they didn't, uh, this was not incorporated into the, uh, the lexicon until 1955, and it was by an amateur astronomer. Uh, named George Vandenberg, and uh, that the idea, it, it took hold. This is our eclipse that's upcoming. This is Saros 145. This one started in uh, the first one, the first partial eclipse was in 1639. Uh, the last eclipse in this Saros will be in 3009. So it's 1,370 years long. These, these are the, the central eclipses here. This is the first central eclipse was here in 1891 near the North Pole. Uh, then 18 years, uh, then, um, 18 years later, uh, 1909, um, another annular eclipse. And then 18 years after that, the first total eclipse in this Saros uh, 1927, another 18 years, uh, 1945, and then um, another 18 years was 1963. Now this one crossed through Alaska and um, most of Canada, or all, all across Canada. Um, this one, I had several friends who went to observe this and take data on it. This was when I was a student at uh, what's now Rhodes College, it was Southwestern in Memphis back then, and my friends were physics majors. Um, the chairman of the physics department, Dr. Jack Taylor, uh, was an infrared researcher. That was, that was his field, and he went to a lot of eclipses and took data on the infrared aspects of total eclipses. He had a contract uh, from the Air Force to do this. This was really secret stuff. And there was a, uh, a locked room in the basement of the, the building where uh, uh, the physics department was housed and locked cabinets in there that held this stuff. Uh, my friends who went on this eclipse expedition took all kinds of infrared data and readings and whatnot and um, they submitted everything and it was all locked up and they never knew what it was for until 1991 uh, I went to, a, to went to a class reunion three years after that 1994 and um, one of my friends who had been on that eclipse trip said that he was watching coverage of the first Gulf War with a neighbor and the neighbor remarked, he said, you know, it showed a video of an American um, plane shooting down an Iraqi plane using a Sidewinder missile. And the neighbor said, why doesn't the missile chase the sun instead of the exhaust out of that jet tailpipe? And my friend said, Ben, I knew what we were taking the data for. 
uh, that was it. It was, that led to the development of the Sidewinder missile. And what they did was to find uh, the, the uh, wavelengths, the infrared wavelengths that were emitted by the sun. And so when they designed the electronics and the optics for the Sidewinder missile, they cut a notch in there so that the missile would ignore that part of the infrared spectrum and would only go after the parts of the infrared that were emitted by a jet engine. And so that was, uh, that's why they were, that's why they went to Alaska in 1993 and they went to India uh, either before or just after that. But that was the, that was the, the whole, uh, the whole purpose of the thing. Um, so that was 1993. Uh, 1963, that is. Um, then another 18 years, 1981, another 1899, and then we get to uh, this one. That's us. That's the one right here. That is Hopkinsville, Kentucky. That's that's going to be Eclipse Central. Um, Actually, Carbondale, Illinois is going to be Eclipse Central just because it's got uh, the facilities to be Eclipse Central. Hopkinsville, Kentucky is, is, is literally a wide spot in the road. Um, but this is, the, this is the Eclipse track, and this is Ceres 145. That's, that's our Eclipse that's, that's coming up. Then there'll be some more, uh, another 18 years, 2035, 120 degrees around the world, and it will be uh, over here, and then another 18 years, 2053, uh, of course, nor North Africa, and so on. And I don't, I'm not making plans to uh, see either one of them. Mm -hmm. This is a reconstruction, and some of this is speculative because the, the mechanism of the Antikythera device had been so badly damaged and parts of it lost. But um, this is these are the cycles that it tracked. There was a front dial and then the back panel. The front dial had the zodiac, the Egyptian calendar, and the parapegma. The parapegma was sort of the, uh, it's the, the, the old farmer's almanac uh, of the ancient world. It had the, uh, the dates on which certain celestial phenomena happened like the heliacal rising of Sirius, that's when Sirius rises with the sun, when certain constellations uh, rise for the first time out of the glare of the sun. And you could use this uh, as timekeeping and to, uh, in, a, in a very broad sense, predict the weather because you know if, it's, if this is happening in the sky, this is what the weather is typically like uh, at that time of year. So that's why they had the, that was the parapegma. Um, then the different cycles, the calyptic cycle, okay, then the metonic times five, this is the lunisolar calendar, and then the saros times four, the exoligmos, and eclipse prediction. This is the gear ratios that are, um, if, if the reasoning is correct, uh, then this is the gear ratios. The metonic dial turns five times in 19 years, and they, they base this on counting the Tooth, uh, the gear teeth, um, and then when they didn't have the actual mechanism in front of them, uh, assuming this is what it was designed to predict, then they have to they have to infer that these are the other uh, gear ratios. And this is a projection of it, and offset wheels uh, for the moon's cycle. They also had a pin and slot. A device in there so that uh, it would take into account the uh, different distances the moon is from the earth. They, they were aware of that. And this is a kind of an exploded view of what it would, what it would look like uh, with the uh, front door inscriptions, the parapegma, the dial here, then the back plate, and then the back door inscriptions. This is, uh, that's Derek DeSoya Price with uh, a partial reproduction of it. And Michael Wright has put together what he thinks is a pretty complete version of it. That's the front, that's the rear. And I'll have to go around to the uh, computer to let's see if it actually does what it should do. Whoop. 
Well, it's distorted here, but. Uh, and I have looked all over the internet for a better resolution of that video, and it's just not one out there. Yeah. Um, I, the, the sound is not on here. They're describing it. And I don't know what's happened to the sound. But that's how it worked. I'm trying to turn the sound up. I'm not getting anywhere with it, but it. Um, but it, it uh, you turned this knob on the side. That was the crank, and then um, the dials would spin, and they would move back and forth in as the uh, planets in the sky appear to do like that. And this little ball here, that's the moon. Okay, show the lunar phases. And you can see these are the, these are the planet pointers. Can you imagine that before clocks or anything else? Yeah, that's the the view inside the the device. You know, that's that's been brought up. If they could do this, why didn't they have good clocks at the time? The reason was it wasn't necessary. Um, there was no reason, from their point of view, to keep accurate time. Even in the uh, even in the, yeah even in the 16th century, um, there were, you you'll find clocks with one hand, and that was enough. Uh, you know, close enough. Um, Real accurate timekeeping became essential in navigation. Uh, if you're going to be out, out out of sight of land, uh, you got to know where you are. And as I say, finding latitude, at least in the northern hemisphere, is easy. What's the height of Polaris uh, at night? But uh, finding longitude is a, a totally different matter because you have to know how far you are from your home port, you have to have an accurate almanac, that is, to know the, the rising and setting uh, positions of stars and of the moon. They use the moon a lot in this. And, but you have to know what time it is on your ship and you have to know what time it is in your home port. And in order to do that, you have to have an accurate clock. A pendulum clock won't work because you, a pendulum clock on a tossing ship is just not going to work. Uh, so it has to be something that is spring-driven, and it was not until the middle of the 18th century that an Englishman named John Harrison um, came up with a clock that was reliable enough, a chronometer that was reliable enough to uh, actually work on board a ship, and he won uh, the prize after intervention by George III. They were trying to stiff him on the, the uh, like 20,000 pound prize, which at the time was uh, just a, a fantastic amount of money. Um, so uh, I'm sorry the sound didn't come up on this because it's, it's interesting and I have no idea how to get it to, uh, to behave itself. But anyway, uh, he did come up with what appears to be a pretty good working model um, of the um, Antikythera mechanism, which predicted eclipses, and that's all I've got unless you have questions. Yes. Well, uh, you're talking about longitude and the clocks. I may not have a name pronounced right, but I think it's Davis Sobel. Oh, yeah, Davis Sobel, yeah. Davis Sobel uh, wrote a book. Yes, on longitude. longitude. Yes. It's one of the best books I've ever read. Yes, it is. Uh, she's a she is an excellent writer. She also wrote another really good book called uh, Galileo's Daughter, okay. which is the correspondence. Uh, uh, well, what we have are Galileo's or his, or his daughter's letters to him. Uh, she would have been forced into a convent. She was an illegitimate child and so was not marriageable. And uh, they had a, a lively correspondence, but uh, she and the, uh, the abbess did not get along and the abbess burned all her letters uh, upon her death. 
So we don't have that side of the conversation. Her latest book is The Glass Universe. Uh, that is also an excellent book. Uh, it it's, uh, has a double, the, the name has a double meaning. Uh, it, it concerns the women who were computers uh, in, the, in the astronomy at Harvard uh, employed by Edward Pickering. And uh, the glass part of it is, is the double meaning, it's the glass ceiling, uh, it's also the glass plates on which images of stars were taken, and these women would carefully measure the spectra that were captured on these glass plates, and some of the most fundamental discoveries in modern astronomy came from these plates by these women who could not be employed as astronomers because they were women but uh, we're wasting a whole lot of talent there. It's an excellent book. It just came out uh, a few months ago. Uh, I've read it, I've got a copy of it, and uh, I will be, I'll be recording that book for broadcast on WYPL, the library's radio station, uh, starting next week. Um, I don't know when the thing will air. It'll be months probably before it does, but uh, it's, uh, I, I highly recommend it. It is in print. Uh, you can get an um, electronic edition. You can get the paperback, you mean the paper edition, not paperback edition. Uh, I prefer the paper edition myself, um, but I, I highly recommend it. She's an excellent author, very well researched, and a good writer. Anything else? Yes. There, okay. Uh. <coughs> we can run it all the way to the end. Yeah. Not how it works on my computer.
the lower display uh, is um, giving the times at which there may be uh, eclipses. Again, it's graduated into months, and the markings are just in those months in which uh, we, we expect her to be an eclipse either of the moon or of the sun or of both. The thing about eclipses is that the cycle, the, they happen according to a pattern which repeats after 223 months. So here we have a four-turn spiral scale with 223 month divisions. This dial is one of the most exciting parts of the mechanism. It was used to predict eclipses of the sun and moon according to a repeating 18-year cycle. The Greeks probably got the data from ancient Babylonian astronomer priests who had been observing eclipses for centuries. Inside the mechanism, you can see the gear trains that drive the pointers on the back dial. This shot also reveals that this model was made of recycled metal plates, just like the original would have been. This is the first model of the Antikythera mechanism to incorporate all of its known features. Thanks to Michael Wright, it's working again for the first time in 2,000 years. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for coming to the meeting tonight.